I'm trying to get harder and tougher mentally and physically every day of my life. You're either the growth mindset or you're the fixed mindset. If you're trying to be the best, you need to look at who the best is and see what they do. Relentless pursuit of progress. There is a difference between the best and the rest. And the rest. Welcome to the Brute Strength Podcast. Champions are built in the mind first. Where we interview scientists, world champions, doctors and experts in just about every area of health and fitness. What do you care enough about? What are you fascinated enough about to go so deep and learn so much that you'll know more about it than anyone else? And now, here's your host, Michael Cashew. Michael Cashew. Hey, this is Michael Kaju, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. This week, I've got Marcus Philly back on the show. Marcus is the creator of Functional Bodybuilding. He is a former CrossFit Games athlete, and the dude just looks like a freak. Everybody wants to look like Marcus. If you haven't looked him up already, follow him on Instagram. Check him out. He's at Marcus Philly, F-I-L-L-Y. And Marcus is honestly one of my favorite people to have on this podcast. We always have such a great conversation. And what I love about Marcus is he is super ethical. He is thoughtful and wise outside of the world of fitness. And he's also having a really big impact on people in fitness. And he's just so passionate about what he does. On this episode, we kind of go all over the map. And we start out talking about, because of the timing of this recording, we talk about the race issues that are going on in the States right now. And I want to make it really clear. My intention by talking to him about this was not to center us in this conversation. I I really strongly believe that the most important people to be listening to and, and paying attention to are black and indigenous people of color. And I just felt I also felt like we couldn't not address it and talk about it. And so uh, I hope it doesn't, it doesn't come across as us trying or me trying to get attention for having that conversation. That, that wasn't my intention. We talk about that. We talk about parenting and because I'm about to have a baby or by the time this comes out, I might already have one. And we talk about the thing that he and his wife do really well that no one is talking about. We talk about personal development exercises that have been most impactful for him lately, the practices that he most attributes to his growth. We talk about something he talks, a concept that he talks about a lot, which is working in versus working out. We talk about what's wildly different about him versus everyone else in in the fitness industry, and I believe this to be true. And then lastly, we talk about what he believes it means to be a man. This was a real joy. Uh, I feel like I learned a lot, and I think you're going to love it. So without further ado, please help me welcome Marcus Philly. This episode is also brought to you by Jumbo CBD. If you're not already on the CBD train, then I'm sure you've at least heard of it before because many people thought in the beginning that this was just a legal way to get high. And unfortunately for some of you, you can't get high on CBD. You can try but you can't get high on it. On the other hand, it can help you sleep better. It can reduce stress and anxiety. It can be huge for pain relief and reducing inflammation. Personally, I've had knee pain for about five years now, and I haven't been able to figure out a way to get rid of it. I haven't, I haven't figured out the root cause. I've worked with PTs and chiropractors, and I just haven't been able to eradicate it. So I have used some pain relieving techniques, and this is one of them. I've used Jumbo's Extra Strength um, 200 milligram balm, and it absolutely does not completely take the pain away, but it makes it manageable. Uh, It allows me to get into a deeper squat. It allows me to walk around and just go about my daily activities without feeling much pain at all. And whether that's placebo or not, I really don't care because I just don't feel like I'm in as much pain. I've also used their sprays and there's a really subtle relaxing effect 
to the sprays. Um, so that's, that's pretty great. Uh, it's helpful for sleep and reduces a little bit of like a feeling of tension in my chest, which I often call anxiety. Uh, it's great for af- athletes and recovery and some specifics and what sets Jumbo apart is that they have a hundred percent natural ingredients, full spectrum CBD sourced from Colorado and Oregon. Uh, they have CO2 extracted oils that are, I think, safer. Uh, they're, they have therapeutic grade essential oils in a lot of their products, third party lab tested, so it's legit. And they're one of the first CBD companies to post their lab results publicly. Uh, I also know the owners of this company very well. They're very close friends of mine, and I trust them deeply. Uh, again, my favorite product of theirs is the 200 milligram extra strength balm. I've also used the sprays, but they also have drops and butters or ghee. I think ghee is like a, a butter type thing. Um, so there's all sorts of different products and they're offering you 15% off of anything in their store. And you can get access to that by going to jambocbd.com and use the code brute in all caps. That's B R U T E in all caps. Uh, A couple more things. So a huge plus of their sprays and drops is that they use MCT oil. So since CBD is a fat soluble molecule, it binds with this oil and allows for much more rapid and effective absorption of the actual CBD. It also has essential oils that add flavor and they bring their own proven health benefits as well. With the muscle bomb, since they use ghee as the base, again, ghee is like a butter type thing. The CBD is binding with the ghee fat and it's able to be carried all the way to the bones. Ghee itself has amazing topical healing properties and when CBD is added, the results can be pretty profound. So again, you can get access to this discount, 15% off of all of their products by going to jambocbd.com and enter the code B-R-U-T-E, all caps, at checkout. Go get them. Marcus, what's happening, man? Just living the shelter in place life, man. I've got it. Go. I've got it dialed in after three months. <laughs> yeah, man. Me too, dude. It's so good to have you back on the show. Uh, I always really love our conversations. Thanks for being here today. Yeah, likewise. Thanks for having me. And uh, it's been—I don't know—it's been six months, twelve months. I don't know. Time flies. It's yeah. been a while. So I'd love to start out uh, with what's most present for you right now. What's what's really taking up? the the most amount of your mental space and energy right now well that is a yeah it's a combination of uh a number of things but they're you know the the sequence of events in the last really three months have been covid pandemic into um you know george floyd's murder and the the social uh explosive movement that came that has come out of that that's been an undercurrent for decades and centuries really but has just the timing of what's happening in the world right now just catapulted it into everyone's uh in this country's awareness in a way like it really i've not ever seen before um, into my own awareness, like it's never been placed in front of me. And then, yeah, just within the last week, uh, watching sort of the fallout it connected to that in CrossFit and CrossFit headquarters and some, you know, some of the things that Greg Glassman, the CEO, said, you know, publicly on Twitter, on recorded zoom calls to affiliates uh that just have just fractured the community that i i really uh, owe a lot to and was a have been a part of directly and indirectly for the my whole adult life really Mm -hmm. you know ever since i i kind of said okay i'm done being a kid i gotta figure out what i'm gonna do crossfit's been this backbone that i've been a part of so it's like this series of global and national events, they're all global events, really, 
have sort of like been like, well, there's this thing out there that doesn't impact me. It's, you know, COVID, right? Uh, It's not us. It's out in the other countries, right? It's in China. It's in Italy. And then it starts to creep and get closer to, you know, my life and um, all of these other events that have happened, I think, as a result of the pressure and the stress that our country and the world has been under due to COVID have just, you know, gotten closer and closer and closer to home to now where it's like, you know, I'm, I'm feeling the, the issues that are at, at hand that people are discussing right now are just like, I'm involved. I'm intrinsically like, you know, a part of, and I can't say like, Oh, well that's just happening out there anymore. (laughs) Yeah. Remind me how, how old are your kids again? Three and a half and, and one and a half. Okay, gotcha. Um, I was talking to Sebastian Younger, who wrote Tribe earlier today, and we were talking about some like a really interesting part of COVID is that it is necessitating that we work together. But the difference now than any other natural disaster in our lifetime is that we have to work together by staying away from each other. Usually during natural disasters, uh, tsunamis, wars, people like almost automatically just come together and they gather and they really support each other. And right now we're not able to do that. And I mm-hmm. think that's why we're seeing the, the, the mental health, all kinds of mental health issues like going through the roof right now, which is super, super sad. Yeah, it is. And, and at the same time, just in the past week, you've seen more social gatherings or political gatherings than I've ever seen in my lifetime too. Yes, so yes. there's no social distancing happening when another cause that people feel more, that they prioritize more deeply and they feel more connected to in a moment arises. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it's, it's almost like, yeah, like people want to come together to work against this thing that is maybe COVID they can't, but here's an opportunity for them to come together for something else and Mm -hmm. they take it immediately. So it's, uh, and, and you know, who's to say that like, that's wrong, you know, but at the same time, it's like, there's still this pandemic happening, right? Like we're, 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 we're within the 14 day, uh, kind of time span of when the biggest demonstrations really started and protests and riots and so this is kind of this interesting time where we're like we're about to see okay well what what did gatherings of tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of people uh do to impact kind of the spread of you know uh, this virus Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what is the conversation around the racial inequality what does that sound like in your household in your business and in your uh, physical community. What are, what are y'all talking about? If you're doing anything, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel really fortunate to be surrounded by some amazing like women that work in my in my business and my wife that work that that the type of work that they do and the contribution to the work that I do helps to balance the perspective of a white man. Uh, to some degree. And I think the conversation that we all are having is this this is a time when we can absolutely be called to action, to do something, to be raise our consciousness, raise our awareness, uh, make some change, donate some money. Um, I don't know, do something in the in the short term. But what's really, you know, what we keep saying to one another is like, okay, well, what are we going to be doing next month? What are we going to be doing next year? And what are we going to be doing five to 10 years from now that honors what people are waking up to today and honors what has been out of the conversation for a long time? You know, I think everybody wants to be on the right side of what's happening right now. Not just to like save face and to look good, but because they really feel called to to take part. But I think it's very much human nature to say, okay, well, there's problems, we fix them, and then we move on. And I think, I mean, I know the the problem of racial inequalities is not a 
it's not a fix that happens today, next week, next month, or even next year. It, it's probably decades of work that have to be done. And so how do, how, how does something, how big does something have to get to really catalyze this, you know, sequence of, of change that's going to last for a while. Mm. And perhaps it's like getting people to put the right policymakers and uh, people in positions of power into place so that they, that stays, you know, their principal focus for the next two years, four years, six years, however long they might be in office or in a position to make change. Uh, CEOs of companies, uh, you know, who are we putting into these, you know, positions to to actually see that we continue to make positive change and not just, um, you know, respond to what's happening in the news today. Right. Yeah, a lot of that really resonates with me. What, what we're trying to do is avoid the knee-jerk reaction of saying or doing something to look a certain way, which I see so much of, and I, I get it. Like, there's so much shaming going on in, on the internet right now, which I think is, is pushing people to say or do something just to avoid uh, humiliation or something like that. And that, that doesn't seem to push us in the direction of a solution. Um, what's really present for me and us right now. And by the time this comes out, I'm sure we will have fully addressed this and be in, in action. But what's really present is in order to, and a D shared this with me last night in order to actually find a solution, we need to understand the problem. And until now, because I've been so privileged in my life, I have never looked into this. And to, you know, I think any time I have felt guilt in my life, I'm very quick to want to like apologize or find a, like decide how I'm going to make things right. So I don't have to feel that feeling of guilt anymore. And I think, um, Ne, you know, quote unquote, negative emotions, guilt being one of those challenging emotions can be a really, really positive thing to just sit with sometimes, because that's what can lead to action and can lead to change. And if we try to bypass those uncomfortable emotions, and just look the other way and, and tell ourselves, oh, you know, I donated a $1,000 to this cause, I'm good, I'm not a racist. Uh, I don't I don't think anything gets done because that happens today. But then what is what is happening in our lives a month from now, a year from now, in our businesses and our families, uh, all of what you're saying? Yeah, I, I the you know, there's uh, I'm paying so much attention to different channels and feeds on social media, trying to broaden, you know, where I'm getting my news from rather than the same, you know, 20 accounts that just show up over and over again. And, you know, whether it's a, a quote or um, some some message that comes across like there are things that really jump out at me day after day <clears throat> what i saw yesterday was the uh this quote and it was something i'll paraphrase but it was we're we're gonna get we're gonna f start to fix the problem of racism when when white people s stop seeing it as a black problem that they empathize with and they see it more as a white problem that they need to get in touch with and, and fix mm -hmm. and what i kind of took from that and what I'm hearing in you and what you just said is that there's not just learning about what this what's going on and what this is it's learning like what's the role that I play in it like by being unaware just silent not taking action looking at my own racial bias my wife shared with me like a, a, a you know an online test I forget what university put it together but it was essentially like what's your racial or ethnic bias mm -hmm. implicit bias you know and there's like a, a long survey there's a, a kind of a test a gamify test that you take at the end and it says oh you have a moderate bias towards caucasian or you know uh, european americans you have a bias towards african americans or so forth and um you know it's it's really having to just like look at those things and be like okay I, I i have some intrinsic bias that i'm i'm maybe not i'm not aware of but there are ways of investigating that and it and you have to be okay like somebody has to say oh, 
I'm, I'm ready to get really uncomfortable to look at this and see where am I doing this in my day to day life? Where is this showing up without me knowing it? What are patterns that I might have? So, yeah, like uh, signing signing my coaches and our staff up for you know courses on racism and 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 activism and where are you where is this showing up in your life and understanding your own biases that that kind of education within companies and within our company i think is the very first step that we're going to start to take that we want to start to take it takes humility to just be like hey i don't i've i've not really been paying attention i need to and you know look to look to the people who have put the time and the energy into understanding, you know, these inherent problems and use their guidance and they want to help, of course, and they're not there to be like, well, hey, you know, you've been like sitting on the sidelines doing nothing, so I'm going to shame you. It's like, no, they, they're there to be like, this is real. Let me guide you in this process. And you're going to, it's going to be hard to hear. And it's going to, you're going to get defensive and you're going to feel like, but it's time. Amen, man. I saw a, I went and joined the the protesting in Austin for a bit and this black lady came up and it was so, it was so powerful. There were a bunch of guys talking before her in microphones and, you know, they said some great stuff and then she walked up, no microphone. And she said, I don't need no microphone. I'm loud enough as it is. And she went on this just amazing rant and shared her, you know, her personal trials and tribulations, which were very moving, inspiring. And then the thing that she said that landed with me most is white people, thank you for showing up today. Thank you. And today is not what matters. What you do from here on out is what really matters. Where will you be in a day, a week, a month? What will you, you know, where will your feet actually take you? And you know, one of my fears for so many people is that um, they care more about how they look to others, and myself included at times, man. I, I definitely feel, I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to do or say anything wrong or do do something that uh, brings humiliation or shame in my direction, and so I, I'm included in that. But I, I, I fear that that will be more of a driver for some people than actually getting into action. But I mm-hmm. think that the, the thing that's been most inspiring for me is just paying attention to black thought leaders. It has opened my eyes to so many anecdotes and stories, but also like the history of policies that have oppressed black people. It is just insane. Have you heard of this documentary? Uh, I think it's called 13th. Mm-hmm. About the, it's about the 13th Amendment. It's a phenomenal documentary. Uh, but I feel like the history of, of policymaking that came after um, slavery was abolished, that ended up continuing this oppression and discrimination, that's also a, a, a really key part of the puzzle. I feel like I'm ranting, but no, yeah, you're not. Great, and, great and to what, get your thoughts, man. Yeah. And I just want to maybe if, if we're going to pivot the conversation somewhere else, I'll say one last thing, which is that um, I feel very much, I have the same feelings about, I care what people think of me. It, it's a, not just on this topic, but in, in general, like I, I know that's a vulnerable spot for me. I'm not, it comes, I think from any part of my life where I haven't had enough time to really reflect on my true core values on a, on a subject. Okay. Now that could be something as simple as like, you know, one way I run my business. I chose to run my business this way. And then somebody challenges me on that. And I'm like, Oh gosh, like I don't, I haven't really, that's not, I'm not so core and solid on where I stand on that. So then take an issue like racial inequality where, uh, you know, it's, it's super, (laughs) it's super vulnerable to be, to, to talk about it. Cause I'm, again, this is not an area that I've spent anywhere near adequate time and energy to sort of understand my position on it, understand how it is impacting the people around me and in the world. And, you know, I, uh, of course, and and just here talking to you, I'm like, oh gosh, like there's going to be a lot of people that listen to this and shoot, I'm, I hope it comes off right. But at the same time, I have to 
you know, I'll acknowledge that. And then at the same time say, I just feel compelled to be part of the conversation and, Mm -hmm. and I'm going to screw it up. I'm going to, I'm going to say the wrong thing at some point, you know, there's, I have to sit with that discomfort, you know, the pressure from Instagram fans to say something when I hadn't said something yet was like, it was heavy. It was like, Hey, I look up to you. Why haven't you said anything? Gosh, you've been particularly silent on this matter. Hey, when are you going to, you know, speak up against what, Greg Glassman said, and it's like the it's a bit of a pressure cooker to say like to say the least. Like you, there, there's no timeline that's going to feel comfortable for me. So yeah, it's like coming on this podcast today. You know, June tenth, twenty twenty. It's like well, the time is upon us where this is the the conversation that everyone's having. Mm-hmm. Have I had like a month or two to like? get com- comfortable and, th- you know, clear on my thoughts and take action and take measurable steps and say, oh, I've done this, I've done that. But like, no, I haven't yet. I'm just, I'm sitting here listening and trying to be as conscious and aware as I can and, you know, consume information in a way that helps to inform me as to what's the right thing to do. But I can't get it all in all at, all at once. And I've definitely played the, the story in my head of like <laughs> feeling sorry for myself because I'm like, dude, I'm... I'm like taking care of my kids full time and trying to run a business and like, I like keep certain things afloat. And like, my time is just tight. And someone's over here messaging me like, Hey, why haven't you said anything? I'm like, I, I don't know. I haven't even, you know, taken a moment to breathe deeply for the last week. But you know, that's, <laughs> that's me feeling the discomfort so much that I'm mm-hmm. like looking for an excuse on my end. And mm-hmm. it's like, like you said, it's just sitting with that discomfort is what's going to, I think ultimately get me and others to sort of say, okay, well, the only way through this discomfort is to start to do something that feels, you know, meaningful and, and purposeful and, you know, gets you to <laughs> reflect to a point where you're like, okay, I know I'm doing the right thing for not only for me, but for, for other people. Mm. Man, thank you for your openness and, and having the discussion in the first place. I know it's a really vulnerable topic. And uh, another thing that you said that jumped out at me is, you know, you know, you're going to say things that are that some people take the wrong way, you're going to mess it up. But that is it is so important that we're all a part of this conversation and we risk uh, doing it wrong, you know, because there's no way we're going to get this perfect. But just sitting out is um, is not part of the solution either. So I appreciate it. All right, man. So I'm about to have a baby. You know this. By the, by, by the time this comes out, uh, I'm sure that he'll already be here. But what uh, what are one or two things, and this is similar to the question I asked you right before we started, uh, what are one or two things that you and Megan did that you don't really hear many people talking about? Things that you really knocked out of the park that you don't think many people are aware about or talk about? Yeah, so with regards to parenting, I would say that, you know, one thing we didn't talk about before we started recording I guess people talk about this, but it doesn't get enough attention. It doesn't get enough priority is the need for the couple, you know, man, man and woman, woman and woman, man and man, you know, whoever, if there's multiple parents, you know, raising a child, and I'm speaking to people that are in relationship, raising children, that getting that relationship, not only solid before, but during and having a process and a system and a support network to keep that relationship really, really solid is so important. And I think my, I think Megan and I made that a big priority mm-hmm. through a lot of different ways. Like we, we have been in couples therapy for, I want to say six years. <laughs> so three, two and a half years prior to having kids, but we maintain that through, we both are in individual therapy. We carved out, you know, at least one day a week where we took a, took a time away from the kids that we had grandparent come to stay with them. Um, so call it a date or just call it reconnection time. Mm -hmm. You're going to get, you're, you're going to lose each other. Like it's just, 
it's just the it's just the nature of those first many months because of the the demands, the sleep demands, the sleep deprivation, the the energy demands. Like you'll just be tired, and when you have time away from the baby, when the baby's sleeping, you just you just want to check out. You don't want to go and like have the deep conversations and go for the walk together where you like connect and you know like you just don't want to do it. And it, I would say with our first child, like. If we hadn't had certain things in place, you know, Megan and I had a lot of ruptures that were going on in our relationship. There were just so much stress. The, our first daughter was, was, I mean, in hindsight, I think she could have been diagnosed as having colic. So she was like very fussy, lots of crying, very challenging at times, you know, on the parents and our sleep schedules. And we were both exhausted and you know, literally having hallucinations in the middle of the night because we were so tired and wow. exhausted. Yeah, like waking up to like Megan, like freaking out in the bed, like, Margaret, where's the baby? Where's, oh my God, I think I'm sleep. I think I rolled over on her. And I'm like, no, she's in the bassinet across the room. Like she's not even in the bed. Like, what are you freaking, you know, like just imagining things. Like it was, it was rough. And wow. it also, you know, for, for, Oftentimes for one of the parents, they might take a bit more of the brunt of caring for the kid, or maybe they have to take a step back from their profession or their, their, you know, whatever they're passionate about to, to care for that child. So like Megan had to take a step back from being a therapist more so than I think she really wanted to, or she did. So she was like feeling disconnected from her career and what did she want to do with her career and it just meanwhile i was like this was like right around when functional bodybuilding like really took off for me so i was like passionate like excited about my work like things were going really well and she's just like at home like not seeing clients and just like what like this you know and that turns into tension yeah. in the relationship so uh, i think that that's just like the first year the first child it's like what like whatever the statistics it's like highest divorce rates like yeah. the first year after marriage the first child the first year of your first child like you know it's a it's a hotbed for problems to basically you know surface right mm -hmm. I think just like we're seeing now you're under pressure people are under stress people are isolated problems start to surface and then they get explosive really fast mm -hmm. that right there was one thing that I think was um I'd say we learned a lot from the first child we did much better with the second child but we had a system in place for that. And then the other one that, you know, you and I just, we talked about was prioritizing the sleep of our kids and figuring out how to train them to sleep. You know, sleep training is something that people talk about and there's a lot of ways to do it. And essentially it, to me, means getting your kids to learn how to soothe themselves and put themselves back to sleep. And that's something that is a very kind of touchy, delicate process with kids because they rely so much on the soothing of their parents from like day one. You're soothing them so much in those first few months and you should, and that's how you develop these bonds. But then there becomes a time where kids can self-soothe and it's so hard on parents to like bridge, make that make that transition to letting them self-soothe, which often looks like crying or having to, you know, quote unquote, cry themselves to sleep. But it's not like this barbaric thing where you're like, oh, you just close the door and you can cry for 10 hours and I'm not going to touch you. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. But there has to, there, there's going to be for anybody that tr tries to sleep train, the majority, excuse me, the majority of people that try and sleep train, there's going to be a period of anywhere from <laughs> 15 to 60 minutes where, you know, your heartstrings are going to be pulled like mm. like somebody is just trying to rip you apart and you're going to have to fight this urge to be like oh, I got to go protect this and just trust that this is best for everybody and when I can and I can say that on the on the back end of having two kids that nap on a schedule they go down and then they wake up at the same time most you know every night every morning they sleep solidly through the night the value that that brings to a relationship, to their health, their physical health, to everyone's mental and emotional health is 
just so profound. And I can see it in other parents that I know that don't have that and haven't didn't make that the number one priority. You know, it, it's it becomes a it, it can become an obstacle. It can mm-hmm. become a real obstacle for the kids, but also to the relationship. So, yeah, those are that's how I would <laughs> they had told my brother right before he had his baby uh, last year. I said, well, you uh, you know invest in a therapist right now (laughs) so you can or some something like that and then you know get on this on the you know be ready to sleep train at this point and and he's yeah they're they're solid their baby their baby started like basically sleeping 10 hours at like two months i was like you lucky guy (laughs) amazing yeah yeah it sounds like they're no matter what the no matter what the temperament of the parents no matter what genes they have babies just come out with different different temperaments and you kind of just don't know what you're going to get oh yeah you don't i mean our first two were i mean our two daughters are very different right Mm -hmm. i think um but i still think that there's uh you know there's certain things that just apply across the board um and you you know like we're rhythmic creatures and you know it's so easy to just try and go with the flow with the kid but the kids the ba- these babies they just don't have they need this they need structure so much and without structure it's just uh it can go it can go bad pretty quickly mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so you're you're someone that is just so highly respected in this industry not only for looking like a Greek God. You're, you're, you're so respected for, um, in my opinion, your wisdom and your thoughtfulness, um, your personal development. Uh, I'm curious what, what things in the personal development realm, habits, practices, exercises have you done lately that have been, um, having a big impact on you? And this could be thing. These could be things that have been habits of yours for a long time that are continuing to yield big results. Hmm. Well, I, nothing. Nothing lately has been. I mean, I, I have carried certain routines over from you know life before COVID, but um, I kind of had to reimagine and redesign life mm-hmm. overnight, just like many people did. Uh, I think for people that are, I don't know, I'll just speak for parents out there. I just got a, you know, a ton of compassion for what that has entailed, whether you have school age kids and you've had to teach them, you know, homeschool them for the past three months. If you've got toddlers and, you know, young kids that aren't at their daycares or preschools and you don't have help coming into the house and you've had to just be on 24 seven with them more or less. If you got high school and college kids that are just at home and they they want to be with their friends and they're going to exercise their freedom to you know make decisions and leave the house and go be risky and it's just that's a it's been a tough challenge for that group of people for the past several months so figuring out new new rhythms with them has been sort of where i put a lot of energy and making sure that my physical needs, my emotional, mental needs are, are getting met uh, has meant, okay, I got to I gotta rethink this. Like I don't have maybe as much time to m- train my body physically because I only have a, you know, a 60 minute napping window where I got to get everything in, you know, or so how do I use them, not use them, <laughs> take them and engage in more physical activity. Mm-hmm. Thankfully, we've been in, pretty good climate for the most most of this shelter in place but you know my daughters and i have been walking and being outdoors so much you know i'm i've i've got a healthy tan right now because of the time that we've all been spending outside which has been really good for them and it's been really good for me and the the notion of like increasing low intensity physical activity every day has really been you know, hugely transformative for me, just the way I feel, the way my body looks um, and moves. I used to be a guy that was like, okay, I'm, I'm working hard, which means usually sitting at my desk most of the day. So when I train, I'm going to go hard too, so I can get a lot in. And now it's like, 
my training is not super hard, but I'm also just moving a lot more. You know, I'll put my, <laughs> I like track my steps and, you know, on a day where I don't even go for a walk with the kids, like I can log seven to 8,000 steps, just kind of like running around the house with them and chasing after them. And, you know, the, the picking up after them, which I'll curse most days. Cause I'm like, I've cleaned this house four times today <laughs> and it's just as messy as it was when we woke up, you know, <laughs> but I'm also like, Hey, you know, I'm, it's keeping me active. It's keeping me moving. And I just, you know, the, the shift from living a like as fit and as active as as I may have been perceived to be I was a sedentary guy right I go to the gym I'd get in my car drive my kids to daycare go to the gym get into my office type on a keyboard talk to some people come out of the gym for 75 minutes work out and then it was right back to sitting around and now I would say that I'm a, I'm an active person <laughs> I'm a much more active person and my productivity in work, I don't believe has dropped significantly. You know, we, we discussed that. It's like, I may not be sitting at my desk in my office for as many hours as I was before this, but because of the rearrangement of lifestyle and uh, prioritizing just sort of moving more with the kids, being active, not just sitting around and watching, you know, iPads. I think when I do get the time to sit at my office, I... I'm focused. I crank on work. I get things done and I'm moving more, which, you know, I, I see people doing and I see people in my neighborhood moving more than they've ever moved. And I think it's raising the, the, I mean, it's certainly a start to, you know, improving the, the health of a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, it's basically a 24 seven walkathon over here. Just totally. people constantly <laughs> passing by our house. Man. Yeah. Yes. And people like looking each other in the eyes and smiling and really acknowledging each other. It's like, you know, we're just desperate for some sort of human connection. I know. And well, and that's the challenge with the mask for people that are, are observing the mask wearing in public is that you don't, you don't get to see the smile. Uh -huh. It's like, it's just eyes. It's like, are they smiling? <laughs> is, that, is that a serial killer or does he like me? <laughs> I would say that my selfie, my selfie game has improved dramatically because I don't have to worry about if my, my smile looks just like ridiculous. I just, you know, it's just all in the eyes and then the mask. That's nice. all they see. <laughs> nice. That's what really matters too. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so... I was doing some research on all of the different programs that you have, and, and one one theme that I saw, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you have your, your program called Persist, and you talk a, a good bit about working in versus working out in relation to that program. Talk to me about that. Yeah, good research on that. I We actually launched, so Persist was a program that I had kind of kicking around for a while, and it was... Uh, you know, it was not something I put a lot of energy towards. Um, I don't know that it, like, it didn't, to me, it didn't stand out apart from the rest of, like, the pers the programs that I had to offer. They all had kind of a very unique perspective. I mean, we've talked before about Awaken Training Series. Since then, I came out with something called Aerobic Bodybuilder. Um, we also had a Functional Body Composition Program, which was, you know, Aerobic Training was the aerobic bodybuilder, body composition, functional body composition. You know, these programs had a very clear perspective and they all kind of, uh, they all connect to the notion of functional bodybuilding, mixing functional training and bodybuilding. It was just how much are we going to sway one side to the next? But something that has always, that has continued to always be present is like, I'm actively investigating what it means to be a functional bodybuilder, what does it look like to use this as a training methodology for just sort of daily life and daily performance? You know, not necessarily like I'm not necessarily trying to put on 10 pounds of muscle. I'm not trying to like, you know, get ready for the open. I'm not trying to boost my aerobic engine. I'm just trying to use these tools that I believe are really viable for the general population to have fun, to stay safe, not burn myself out. And that has sort of become like this clear, this clarity I have around persist as like our sort of our, our subscription program. It's like, you know, join the persist, like FBB persist movement to, to really 
live and breathe and embody functional bodybuilding on a day to day. And that <clears throat> starts to then encompass not just working out, but like, what are you doing to like work on yourself, you know, and work inward and, and take time away from like movement to better yourself and, and working. So work out, work in uh, matter of fact, I think it was first, like, you know, the, 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 the language around that was like presented to me by a guy who's uh, putting together like a, a book. He was like, man, we got to talk more about working in and more of like the personal development, the spiritual development, the things that, you know, are, are a foundation underneath which you build your physical capacities. Um, and if you don't have that, then when the physical stuff goes wrong, you're going to be kind of feeling lost and you're not going to have a, a, you know, you're not going to feel grounded and you're not going to be able to kind of get through or persist through those obstacles. Mm -hmm. um, so even in some of the early programs I wrote, you know, on a, on a Sunday when people were taking a rest day, I took it as an opportunity to just like, you know, discuss a, you know, a, a fitness related topic but something that maybe people wouldn't associate with getting abs. <laughs> it's like, hey, did you did you uh, did you take time to connect with somebody that you know a close relationship or kind of an acquaintance that you haven't spoken to in a while? Like, take ten minutes to call a friend today and to just learn what's going on in their life. You know, that let that nurture you, let that heal you on your rest day so that Monday you show up and you feel kind of recharged by that. You're ready to get back into your training. So I have a work, a work in exercise weekly for people looking at kind of, well, ex exposing people to different, you know, different stuff that I see out there, like on a, on a day of the week where instead of like, uh, you know, doing some traditional cool down stretching, you know, routine that somebody might be very familiar seeing in the functional you know movement space we're going to do breath work you're going to lay on your back you're going to put your legs up and you're going to do box breathing for five to seven minutes and that's that's also becoming more sort of well known and mainstream to some degree but i'd say a lot of people just aren't they're not connected to their breath they haven't even explored that so it's this platform to say okay let's Let's use functional bodybuilding, but let's explore all the parts that make, you know, for a, a well-balanced approach to health and fitness for a long time. And yeah, we're still going to do the kettlebell, you know, rack, you know, lunges and curtsy squats and, you know, the Philly press and, and the stuff people have come to like about functional bodybuilding. But we're also going to kind of, you know, continue to build these really aware, conscious athletes, people that are just moving through the health fitness life lifestyle superhumans man that's Kick right ass. yeah that's, <laughs> that's so well-rounded man uh, a book that comes to mind is the power of full engagement and one of the things that i learned in that book is that you're you know it's just a reiteration of you're only as strong as your weakest link and so we have our, our physical, mental, spiritual health. And if any of those are lacking, then we are leaking energy somewhere. And to be fully engaged in one area requires us to be fully engaged in all. And it takes into account that we only have so many hours in a day and some of us have children and, you know, we can't be devoting eight hours to every single thing that matters to us in life. Um, but we can set up our life in a way that is nourishing and allows us to feel uh, fulfilled. It doesn't have to be optimized per se, but it allows us to feel fulfilled. And the, the, the whole point is to be able to operate optimally overall. I love that. I mean, and that's, uh, yeah, I talk, uh, we, we, well, We've uh, as a as a staff, we've gone through the Precision Nutrition Education platform recently. You know, they talk about coaching and like the the holistic approach to coaching and and all the different pieces that play into you know physical health, spiritual health, emotional health, mental health, your relationships that you have around you. They they, they name a couple different areas. They call it that's how that's how you coach deep health. Mm -hmm. And um, I I feel like that's you might have the fitness, like the, the exercises, the physical thing that gets somebody in, involved. But then once you get them hooked, then it's like, uh, you know, it's almost, uh, I don't want to say it's like, you're, it's, it's kind of an, a responsibility, I feel, to sort of 
use that platform to sort of raise people's awareness in these other areas so that because the, the if they're just working their physical health right or the physical part of their health and fitness journey you know that that is not going to fulfill them over time because that will break and it's how how well you're attuned and attending to the other areas that will allow you to kind of persist through those obstacles so i might have let's say we got 100 people doing persist there might be 10 that read the work in exercises and really connect to them but that's kind of okay you know people are just they're going to come to that stuff when it, the time is right for them and uh they'll be open to it and you know the, the truth is that the vast majority of people that are engaging in buying fitness programs or even buying nutrition coaching are very singularly focused on like I just got to go and get my nutrition dialed and I'm good to go. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, you actually kind of have to look at like your, you know, your traumas from when you were a kid. That's how we're actually going to get your nutrition dialed in. But they're not ready to go into like the, you know, the, 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 the psychology of what underlies their challenges of sticking to eating quality food, you know, nine times out of 10. Right. And, and then somebody says, I got to lose weight. So I got to go get the workout. It's like, well, you have this really terrible relationship in your life that basically, you know, leads to self-sabotage on a monthly basis. And so you, you stop your workout program every month. You have to restart one every month. So it's, is it really a new exercise program that's going to, so whatever you, I, I, and I've said this, I think to, with you before, it's like use a variety of tools to get people in. If people are looking for workouts, cause that's what they think that's, that's what they think they need then sell them workouts. And then once they're bought in, you know, be ready to expand kind of their, help them expand their view. Um, if you see it as a coach, if you know that's valuable, if you know that that's part of the process, that, and you're just going to sell them a good workout and you're just going to sell them a good kettlebell flow, then you know you're not giving them the, f the fullness of what you have to offer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're missing you're an opportunity for sure. Yeah, totally. What do you think is the most wildly different or unique thing about you in comparison to others in the fitness industry? I mean, I, I just, the deeper I go into this thing, and by this thing, I mean functional bodybuilding. I, I've talked to some of my my friends and other influential people who do, you know, they have different platforms in fitness and I just, I start to see that like the thing that I've really, <laughs> I've spent uh, close to 15, almost 20 years thinking in this framework of like, I truly did want to look good. Like I, I started out wanting to look good. I also fell in love with learning what my body was capable of doing. So let's call that performance or, you know, GPP. Mm -hmm. And, and over the past like 10 years, I've really started to think more about how does this nurture my, like, like my purpose, my sense of purpose, like my soul, my spirit. I would say that oh, if I, if I could have, and I, I've thought about this, if I could have said I've competed on stage in bodybuilding and I competed on stage at the CrossFit games, like the bodybuilding show in trunks or whatever, right? Is kind of like maybe the one thing that's not on my resume that would really round out this notion of like, I'm, I've am i really given the aesthetic side of this thing deep, deep consideration and real work. I've given the performance side of this thing deep consideration and real work. And I've, I've done it. I've done it to like high, high levels. And I see that a very large group of people and I, I, I could get into a sort of an argument that's like the vast majority of people that want a taste of both. Mm. But to do either one <clears throat> to the fullest, you have to neglect the other side. But nobody wants to do it to the fullest. Mm. Nobody wants to get on stage and nobody wants to go to the CrossFit Games. I mean, there's a few people, right? But it's like, it's it's just these margins of yeah. society. Well, I assume when you say want it, you mean they don't want it 
and back it up with their actions. Like if they really wanted it, they would devote and sacrifice so much more in their life to actually go and oh. get it. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, they think um, they want it. I think less and less there are people that think they want the, the, the big stuff up uh-huh. there, the, the CrossFit Games. They want to do a local comp. Well, I don't think I – don't, does that exist anymore? Do the CrossFit Games exist? I'm just kidding. I th- I think I think it's debatable whether that will actually what's going to happen with that. But uh it's funny, yeah. Like I I'll get people that still ask me like I want to go to regionals. I'm like, you know those don't exist anymore. Wow, <laughs> like, wow. Yeah. Um anyhow, that was a side note, but yeah, it's like they don't back it up with their actions. But I think what what I mean by that is that they jump onto the training plan that is designed to get the person to the pinnacle, mm-hmm. but they don't really want to go to the the you know the peak of that. Yeah. So they're just getting kind of sucked into this current of like train, train twice a day, five six days a week with super high intensity and, and challenging volume. And it's like, but you don't want to you you don't really want to go to the games. Mm-hmm. Like you don't that you never said that you're just doing that because that's this model of what's it's there. So. I don't know. I, I kind of continue to feel like I, I'm uniquely positioned in the middle of these two, these two areas, and that continuing to develop the thoughts and the process and the deliverables of what training that way, what educating other coaches to also be able to coach their clients in that way looks like is just really it just fires me up. It keeps me, keeps me excited. You know, like when I go out into the backyard right now and I train and I do a session that has a snatch and, you know, hamstring curls and single arm dumbbell bench press. I'm like, dude, this is, this is unique. Like this is not how people look at fitness. There have not been enough people who have really started to see like, Let's go do tough contractions. Let's go do tough things. Let's go do challenging movement. And then let's go get a pump. Yeah. And then let's go do some aerobic breathing. <laughs> it's like, and let's mix it all together. And, you know, that's, and again, I'm looking at this from like the perspective of somebody who just loves, who loves the gym, loves to train. I haven't fallen in love with, you know, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or some like application of fitness into a skilled sport. I've just fallen in love with fitness and the the sport of fitness, the 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 process of you know lifting weights and bodybuilding. Like I've I'm in love with that, and I think a lot of people love that stuff, yeah. you know. And they they haven't connected to a martial art or they haven't connected to a recreational sport, but they connect to to moving weights and and expressing their body physically. And within the context of that, for people that are deeply in love with that, that really resonates with them. I also appreciate how much it seems like you pay attention to longevity and being comfortable and healthy in this meat suit that is going to take you through the rest of your life. Yes. I think that that is what, that is part of what I see as the, the pro what's problematic about chasing the be, to be trying to be the best in, in any one thing, you know, and that's become more and more clear to me. It's like, if you want to be the best at CrossFit, go for it. I did that for five years and it was incredibly fulfilling, but you're not going to feel good. Yeah. And if you feel good, you're not doing it the best that you can. <laughs> you're like, if you yeah, feel chipper right. every day, yeah, you're not, if you wake up and you're like, this feels great. Like you're either 20 and you just like <laughs> recover amazingly, or you're not doing it right. You know? And same thing with a, a bodybuilder, right? Somebody who's going to win stage shows, like, I talked to Dave Lipson now quite a bit and, you know, he's just a, he's such a character and he's got, you know, such a unique perspective now that he's really gone into that sport deeply, but it's like bulking. He's like, it sounds cool because you get to eat a bunch of stuff. He's like, it's miserable. It's like, I'm eating so much. I'm having to get blood work done every like, you know, six weeks to make sure my kidneys are functioning. He's like, then cutting is like a whole nother process of like, you know, you're just pissed and angry because you're trying. You're you're such in such a de- deficit, and I'm, I'm like, yeah, it's not going to feel good if you want to really crush it. And so when, and I can, and now I feel like I can speak to this so much more honestly with with clients and people that are interested in 
making big changes. Like, Hey, I really want to gain 10 pounds of muscle this year. How, how should I go about it? I'm like, you better be ready to do some uncomfortable stuff. Yeah. <laughs> like you gotta, you gotta want it. And, and what's like you said, it's like people don't back that up with their actions. They say they want something. They don't back. I, I without judgment, I just am playing this like very, like, the truth mirror it's like look look into the truth mirror they're gonna it's gonna tell you what's real what's not and you get to make that decision and i'm here to support you one way or the other if you want to find a a sustainable approach to moving well feeling good and looking a little bit better than you did before let's do it if you want to get 20 pounds of muscle on your body okay you ready to go to war with that iron and with the food and with the plate and with you know your sleep and with your no alcohol and with all the things that are going to come with it somebody's going to say yes yeah you know most people are going to say oh no yeah (laughs) not interested i also love that you your being and your presence online sort of gives people permission to take their time a little bit more and not be so aggressive on themselves, which it's kind of a paradox because you look like an absolute freak of nature and guys want to look like you. And yet the way that you speak to them gives them permission to, I don't know, loosen their grip on their goals a little bit and just take their time and stay focused for the long haul, which in the end I think will allow them to get more of their reach more of their goals. Yeah, well, I'm. Thanks for saying that. I'm glad that that's a, that's a perception of, that people can have of me and, and how I present online. And you know, something that uh, when I turned 35 this year, I really was able to say like I went to the gym for the first time when I was 15 years old. Like that was really when I started to go to the gym. So I I got two decades of doing this thing, and that just seems like such a you know that's such a milestone. And it's like, hey, Marcus, like, how did you, how did you build your muscle? And I'm like, well, I started when I was 15, and I'm 35 now. Hmm. And I, you know, and barring like a, a one to two, one or two like three month periods in my life, I've not really strayed too far from just lifting weights and moving my body in that way. So, okay, so yeah, it's you gotta like the goal is to create consistency for people so that they can not only achieve their goals, but sustain those whatever metrics that they are are trying to achieve for a long time. The only way you can create enough consistency for somebody to get there is with a program that keeps sustainability in mind, with a program that keeps them interested and excited, right? And with enough of the support and conversation around other aspects of the life that support that, right? So, that's that's what we all have to be doing and uh you know again another conversation i had this morning was like the person who's uh, you know uh, a leader of a pretty prominent fitness brand and they're like you know hey i'm i'm more or less like a fitness agnostic like i don't really care what you end up doing as long as you do it safely you know you're not you're not like blatantly trying to hurt somebody and and you can be consistent at it whether that's orange theory or if it's bjj or if it's crossfit or if it's personal tra- whatever it is like just do it like that's great right and uh i feel the same way it's like i i want people to be consistent i feel like we have a a system and a method and, and an approach that works for a lot of people to stay consistent and to stay engaged and to have fun and not burden themselves out after a few months but uh, i'm not closed off to other ideas and i'll keep can, I'll continue to think about oh how do we how do we continue to deliver that for a long time. Mm. So I want to hear about a little bit about each of your programs briefly, and then I have a, a few rapid fire questions. So tell me, give me the give me the lowdown on each one of your different programs and what sets them apart. Yeah, I'll I'll kind of um, we talked about persist and persist is uh, just like I said it's it's the functional bodybuilding lifestyle. It's what's current for me, what we're doing now. Like we have a minimalist uh, version of it, which has helped a lot of people during, you know, shelter in place. And I think it will stand to be a program that we always have because training with one set of dumbbells, a jump rope and a few bands, you know, I've learned so much about how to design in that, in that world that we can create some really good programs that give people consistency, allow them to 
get good workouts in at home or even work out when they're on the road in, you know, a hotel type gym with minimal stuff and, and get a great, great training session in. But then we also have like a full equipment version of persist for the people that are in the gym and, and they really have, you know, they essentially have command of functional movement and they can, they can look at a page and be like, Oh, we're going to do a power clean today. Cool. I can do that. We're going to do some dumbbell bench. I can do that. I can swing a kettlebell. I can push a sled. Right. The other big program that we've been, you know, we released this year was functional body composition and functional body composition sort of came from like my experience with Pollock methods, uh, years back and doing German body composition, which was essentially his introduction of weight training for aesthetics, uh, as opposed to doing cardio. So like use weight training to burn, f- burn body fat. I mean, he was, he was groundbreaking in that. And that was decades ago and it's still around today. And obviously people use it all the time. They use methods and, you know, permutations of it. I've done some German body composition programs in my lifetime. I've given a lot of them to clients. And again, it's like, that's very bodybuilding heavy. Yeah, he uses compound lifts. He also uses a lot of isolation lifts, a lot of tempo, a lot of precision to counting reps and sets and rest periods, but there lacks a bit of the functional side of things, right? Whatever you want to call it. So I was like, okay, I want to, I want to marry some of these principles together. And we came out with functional body composition. And I think it's a phenomenal program for people that want to, you know, do some true hypertrophy type training, whether it's for fat loss or muscle building, whichever they want. Um, they, you know, it's great for the person who's a bodybuilder who wants to try and mix in some functional stuff. There's a, you know, there's a few AMRAPs in there. There's some things that like get them breathing and doing some muscle contractions under fatigue, right? Like the essential basic principles of kind of CrossFit are mixed in. So that's, that's been fun for a lot of people. It was fun for me in creating it and kind of coming up with the concepts. And then you know, still the one that's still out there that's very prevalent and it will always remain is Awaken Training Series. That was like the, there's been updates to it since we first released it, you know, several years ago. Um, but function, uh, excuse me, Awaken Training Series was sort of the, the first a- attempt at writing a program that was labeled functional bodybuilding. Mm-hmm. And what's unique about Awaken Training Series as compared to the other two I just talked about is that well, you talked about longevity. One of the key tenets of functional bodybuilding is, you know, I, I write about it, simple equals strong, sort of less is more. We cannot ride at the top of our pyramid of movement, you know, exclusively without paying our dues back at the foundation. And I found that that was so pervasive in CrossFit was that everything was an upward climb. Everything was got to do more, got to get the better skill, got to do the heavier thing, got to do this. And there was not, uh, there wasn't enough honoring of like, what's the simplest thing you could do today? You know, the virtuosity concept was there, but it wasn't in, nobody was applying it. Nobody was going back and doing light squats at slow tempo to just show how much command they had of positions. Nobody was doing the, you know, hip abduction exercises to strengthen their external rotation and strengthen their, their positions. And like, it just wasn't part of it. So awaken training series was like, okay, I don't care how good you are. I'm breaking you down to the, 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 you know, the beginning. And the reason I did that was because that's what I did. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I did. I was, 12 fittest in the world, and I went right back to doing lateral band walks, landmine presses, bottoms up kettlebell carries, tempo squats, and aerobic work. And it changed my life, Mm. like completely. So those programs, ATS, are still there, and they truly, they can take somebody through a 12-month journey of, let's go from simple to complex, and some of the most amazing like transformations and ex, uh, client experiences I have seen come out of there. Um, you know, one one in particular was like, you know, a guy who was, I think in his like early 30s, had never done CrossFit before. He came and never done an Olympic lift. All right. Yeah, he had some training experience, but he started from the beginning. 
it was like the final week of the 48th week of the program and he sends me a video and he squat cleans 275 beautifully wow and he's like and he's like dude you taught me how to olympic lift with this program and i'm like what like i mean we start with like you know clean pulls and muscle cleans and we build our way there but you know a squat clean doesn't come into the program until like week 43 or something wow. like that so i was just like i mean it gives me kind of goosebumps to think about that you know when you truly are ready to commit to a process mm -hmm. and you have a system in place that will help you build that is thoughtful and takes a progressive approach that you could do amazing things right but as you know not everyone's ready to commit to a long-term process they want to start with hey i want to just do something for six weeks or eight weeks right i want to just maybe i'll jump in the subscription i'll try it for a few and then i'll back out right and that's fine i got that i got persist i got functional body composition for you if you're ready to like dive in and like you want to, you know, I want to go through the, the journey, Awaken Training Series is still, it's still a beautiful, you know, path to take. Mm, bad ass, dude. That, <laughs> that, that fires me up, man. Cool. So I have a few rapid fires. Uh, they don't have to be rapid answers, but just answer these however you want. Finish these uh, sentence stems. Being a man means... Doing my absolute best to, to see the world through the eyes of my, the three women in my house. <laughs> like it's, uh, I was, I am truly blessed to have two daughters. Like I don't, I don't think I was meant to have a son. I needed to be surrounded by feminine energy or, or women. Um, and they have their own masculine energy, but just needing to see, see life through a different through the through a different lens for sure amen i am i am you know my first my first the first thing that came to mind was i am and then i was i was going to fill it in with an action like i am trying to do something and i just catch myself because uh, that that's not about i am that's like i'm doing this or that whatever whatever um I don't know. It's I am. I think I. I feel like right now it's like I am learning. That's it. I'm just. I'm like, or I'm open, or I'm. I'm receptive. You know. Uh, my wife kind of reflected back to me in some of our work together. That. <clears throat> I think whether it was just part of my upbringing, or how I was praised as a kid for certain aspects of like certain things I did well. I think I. I will always kind of be pulled back to feeling like it's it's hard for me to not know stuff. Like I feel a lot of shame in not knowing the answer, or not being right, or not you know doing something wrong. And uh, I'm, I am working that in my life now to be more open and like I, I don't know everything. I, it's okay for me to not know right now because I'm just I'm just open. And there's such freedom in that. There, yeah, yeah, there can be. Yeah, I'm working on that. And lastly, I believe... I believe that everything that's happening right now is supposed to be happening. Yeah. Yeah, I agree too, man. And I think, um, yeah, I believe in our country and I believe in our ability to to rise to the occasion and to change. Marcus, thank you, brother. You're the man. This has been great. Thanks a lot, Michael. Yeah, dude. So um, let's see. You're at Marcus Philly, I believe, on Instagram. That's right. M-A-R-C-U-S-F-I-L-L-Y. And then what, what is your website? Revival-strength.com. And so if you're a man or woman listening to this show and you want to get into the absolute best shape of your life and also level up your consciousness and live longer and be happier go check them out thanks a lot brother. thanks thank you 
Thank you for listening to this week's episode. Your journey towards better fitness continues. Head over to BruteStrengthTraining.com to connect with Michael and his guests. Access links and resources mentioned in this episode, as well as bonus content exclusive to podcast listeners. That's BruteStrengthTraining.com.